Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to just hold a couple of minutes before we kick off as people continue to join. So we'll start in another, in another minute or two. Hello everyone, my name is Kristen Hanser and I'm the Senior Partnership Manager at the Green Sports Alliance. On behalf of the entire Alliance team, we hope you're all staying safe and healthy and we thank you for taking the time to join us today as we kick off an Earth Month webinar series in partnership with the Sport Ecology Group in the lead up to the 50th anniversary of Earth Day coming up on Wednesday, April 22nd. We also have our project coordinator, Jessica Crawford, with us, who will be posting live updates on our social media channels throughout the discussion, so keep an eye out for those. And closed captioning is brought to you by LNS Captioning, and we thank you for your services as partners of the Alliance. Before we begin, I just have a few housekeeping items. First, we will be making both the slide decks and the webinar recording available following today's session. And so we will be sending a follow-up email to all attendees with how to access these. You can view the recording on the Green Sports Alliance YouTube page and also at the Sport Ecology Group's Earth Month webinar website, which is listed here. In case you didn't see our announcement a couple of weeks ago, we are rescheduling our 2020 summit for a later date as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. More details will be coming soon and will be available on our, our summit website, which is listed here. You can feel free to reach out to myself or other members of the Alliance team with any questions. And I also just want to flag the list of webinars that we will be doing this month alongside the Sport Ecology Group. So we are kicking off today and we will have two next week and then uh, one the week after leading up to Earth Day on the 22nd. On Earth Day itself, we will have a digital resource fair and we will be releasing 50 curated green sports resources in honor of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. So you can register for any of these webinars at the sportecologygroup.org slash Earth Day and we'll also be sending this link in the follow-up email. Okay, so as a quick reminder, there will be plenty of time for Q&A with our guests after they each provide a brief overview and background of their work. So we encourage you to type in your questions into the chat box at any time. We will do our best to cover as many of the submitted questions as we can. So to kick things off, it's my pleasure to introduce our first guest, Clara Del Negro. She is the campaign manager of the Athletes for the Earth program at Earth Day Network. Claire, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much, Kristen, appreciate it. Um, if you wanna jump to the first slide, I can jump right into the presentation, thanks. Um, thank you to you and Green Sports Alliance um, for the opportunity to speak today. And uh, looking over today's registrants, it's great to see so many um, sports affiliated organizations tuning in. Um, I know many of your organizations already uh, do annual actions for Earth Day, so thank you for that. And uh, hopefully we can inspire and motivate you to, you know, start, continue, or grow your um, 
sustainable activities. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Thanks. So for my part in today's webinar, um, I'd like to do a brief, brief uh, overview of Earth Day's organization and mission, uh, explain our goals and the Athletes for the Earth campaign, uh, and then I'll introduce you to one of our ambassadors for the campaign, Chris Nasder. Uh, and I know the Q&A is gonna be later, so next slide, thanks. Um, so I'm Claire Del Negro. I've been actively involved in Winter Olympic sports for over 35 years, specifically in the sport of luge. Um, as an athlete, coach, team manager, CEO, uh, and asked to serve on the uh, board of our international governing body. And I'm still currently in that role as vice president of sport through the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics. Uh, I got involved with Earth Day for their 40th anniversary and set up the Athletes for the Earth initiative. Um, and now 10 years later, uh, they asked me to step in and re-innovate the campaign. Um, as part of Earth Day Network's 50th anniversary that we're gonna celebrate this month on April 22nd. Next slide, please. Thanks. So this is just a brief look at where Earth Day started in 1970 and where we are today. And I really wanted to highlight uh, that 50 years ago, Earth Day started a movement um, to global awareness that there was climate crises uh, smog, polluted rivers, some were actually catching on fire, oil spills. Um, and the mobilization from that first Earth Day was very significant. It, it led to a wave of action that included landmark environmental laws in the U.S., like the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water and Endangered Species Acts, and also the creation of the EPA. Um, Today, you can see uh, from this slide that we've grown into over 192 countries now, and we engage over 75,000 global partners. And our goal this year is to mobilize a billion people globally and to help drive really transformative change uh, for our planet. Next slide. So um, due to the current pandemic that we're all um, fighting, uh, Earth Day is dynamically moving, it's, it's changing every day for us too, into our first digital Earth Day uh, for 2020. Uh, it's really gonna be our 24 hour window where our voices are heard the loudest. Um, and we're asking our global community to um, save the planet, save the earth. And you can see from the acronym on the slide, it's pretty self-explanatory um, to speak up, um, basically, that means that have, you know, each community uh, on this webinar also can use their platform to create awareness, um, to act, to inspire your community to take action, uh, to vote locally, regionally, nationally for politicians who support climate action, laws and initiatives, and to educate, to uh, explain what your business or your school or your league is doing to promote sustainability and how others can also be inspired to take action. Uh, next slide. So that's our, our overall mission for Earth Day uh, for our Athletes for the Earth initiative. You can see our, our goals and um, ideals here. We wanted to uh, capture our sports communities and unite them. Uh, we started with getting individual athletes to speak up about their personal experiences with a deteriorating environment and uh, speak to the intersection of really sport and climate. And over 10 years, so many sports groups have now formed who are concerned about um, all the climate crisis that we're now trying to reach out um, and, and connect with those groups and try and inspire um, and unite those voices uh, to take action, not only this year for the 50th anniversary, but for an ongoing basis. Um, and Green Sports Alliance is a, is a great example of that. We're happy to be chatting with them on the same basis. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So, oh, Q&A, we can bump that slide to the next one. We're gonna do that at the end. <laughs> Thanks. So given our, uh, our mission and our background, um, I'm gonna throw it over now to one of our celebrity athletes for the earth, uh, Chris Mazder, uh, whose resume you can see here, it's very impressive. And one thing he didn't mention on it is that he did a stint um, on Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> So uh, I think that makes him a true celebrity. And Chris, if you want to step in, I'll, I'll say thank you to everybody for listening to me and stay safe and healthy in this environment um, that we're all fighting. And let's uh, continue globally 
uh, to fight not only this virus, but the climate crisis also. Thank you for your time. Thanks for that, Claire. Yeah, um, definitely dancing with the stars is something that makes you a celebrity over sledding, but uh, we're still working to push luge into the mainstream, especially with the Olympics so close. Um, yeah, uh, I am an Olympic luge athlete. And I guess my story with uh, you know, sustainability starts by living in northern New York. I grew up in Saranac Lake, New York, which people don't realize is one of the coldest places in the country. And I rely on winter for my livelihood. Um, I started luge at the age of eight because it was ultimate sledding. And the winter gives us activities like skiing, skating, and in my case, sledding is what took me to my um, current career path. But, you know, this is what's made me aware is that I've seen firsthand the consequences of global climate change. I, I mean, this past winter in Europe, there really wasn't a winter I can count on my hand the amount of times I saw snow. One hand, I should say. And, you know, as an athlete, it's something that, especially a winter athlete, it's something that's always on our minds where we really do want to protect the environment because the winter is what supports what we do and what we love. But sustainability and elite performance don't always go hand in hand. I mean, I travel country to country in the winter and I leave a massive CO2 footprint, which is something I'm very conscious about and I offset with carbon credits. But, but what we get, the platform that athletes have is really important. And I think the current environment is, is perfect to this. People don't listen to the 97% of scientists who say that trends over this past century are extremely likely due to humans. Uh, they don't listen to politicians, um, you know, with the coronavirus happening right now, let's stay indoors, let's, you know, flatten the curve. People don't listen to scientists and politicians, but they do listen to athletes and their peers. And that's what gives our voice so much power, is that we bridge what, you know, politicians and scientists are pushing. And, that's why it's so important for athletes, uh, it's so important for sports to really embrace sustainability and to show how it changes in our sports at the venues they can affect daily life. Um, and that's why I think it's so important to educate athletes because they will you know, educate their listeners. And um, if you could go to the next slide, please, Kristen. That's why I really have to say, you know, thank you for Earth Day and myself. Uh, for being guests on this webinar and showing how important it is for you know athletes and sports to you know uh, to be here and to promote sustainability. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Claire, for that introduction. We will come back to you guys with questions that we're we're seeing come in. But first, I just want to introduce our next guest, which is Brian McCullough. He is the co-director of the Sport Ecology Group. Brian, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to thank the Green Sports Alliance for partnering with the Sport Ecology Group to launch this webinar series. Uh, it's been been put together pretty quickly, but we're going to have a pretty awesome uh, output here, uh, kind of taking advantage of the time that we do have, um, uh, given the circumstances that are going on. Um, my personal background, I'm an academic by training, uh, an associate professor in the Albert School of Business and Economics at Seattle University. And here we launched the first Sports Sustainability Leadership Certificate, and Kristen was one of our star pupils that came out of that certificate program uh, before she went on to get her MBA. So uh, there's a lot of uh, close personal connections here. Uh, when the Sport Ecology Group was uh, created, uh, we kind of were motivated by this background of our individual research and work. Uh, but we were trying to engage practitioners in the industry, uh, but our solo efforts and inroads that we were trying to establish were slow to really gain traction. And so, like Claire mentioned, uh, trying to collect uh, a group of people together, we wanted to organize academics and scholars to be able to help and advance and enhance the conversation that's going on in this space. And so we organized people with similar research interests to be able to forward this work. And so Maddie uh, Orr and I connected, uh, and the idea of the Sport Ecology Group came about. We assembled a team of researchers, primarily in North America, with various research backgrounds uh, and focal research areas that are very diverse but span the scope of the sport industry and the business of sport. And to, we plan to move into a more global network in the upcoming year. But this is driven by our mission 
to next slide, please. Um, the sport ecology group is a group of academics, as I mentioned, and we study the sport, uh, study sport and the natural environment and the relationship between the two. And so we are driven by the following mission. And you can see this here, uh, but ultimately we want to be able to produce high quality research in sport ecology. We want to catalyze the industry and academic knowledge exchange. And so while we might be theoretical and empirical with our research, we want to make sure that it's applicable to industry practice. So that, again, it can inform and enhance what is currently being done. We want to raise public awareness around sport ecology related topics and create opportunities for students specifically to learn and grow as professionals. And that could be uh, both from an educational standpoint of current and future sport practitioners. But uh, this mission really is driven by the different problems that we're trying to address. Next slide, please. And those problems are obviously, uh, has been stated here, the climate is changing. Uh, certain science communication is lacking, specifically with engaging people in areas and activities that they enjoy, um, whether it be participating or spectating sport, so the way that they consume and consume sport. There's obviously fake news that's going out there and alternative facts are, are prevailing, so we want to be able to be data-driven. So the, the conclusions that we make are based off of empirical data that we've collected or that others have done. Uh, so the scientific data and empirical evidence are not necessarily being made readily available to managers and leaders. And so we want to be able to add that to the conversation and enhance again what practitioners are doing. And the sports sector has not yet to fully uh, take advantage of this platform to educate and inspire. Uh, there are obviously exemplar organizations. Uh, they're members of the sport, um, of the Green Sports Alliance. But we also want to make sure that we're reaching all sport organizations as best as we can. And so our solutions to these problems, next slide please, um, again are, are through our research, right? Um, our, as academics, our bread and butter is our research and teaching. And so those are the two primary focal areas there. But again, to make sure that it's applicable and that our research is relevant, we want to make sure that we have a strong industry liaison. And so we're kind of having our fingers on the pulse of what practitioners are, are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, whether that be how do we properly engage fans? Uh, how do we prepare our organization for climate vulnerabilities? And those types of large questions that organizations might be asking that may not necessarily have the expertise or the bandwidth internally to, to be able to answer those questions. So we can come in and, and enhance that again through a very academic approach and data-driven approach. And then lastly, we want to be able to translate this research for public education as well. And so we really want to be able to engage fans and enhance again the fan engagement campaigns that go beyond the scope of a sporting event or the context of sport and truly really translate that into everyday lives. Next slide, please. And so one of the initiatives that we have, uh, uh, Matty Orr has a podcast that you can find on our website, uh, but another initiative that we do have is a graduate mentoring initiative. Uh, and so we really wanna be able to mentor graduate students specifically uh, as they are advancing their career. And so whether they're going into academics uh, or academia, or into industry, we want to really be able to provide them the context that may not currently be there in their classwork. And so we can provide this content specific areas and kind of direct them in certain ways, whether it be for class projects or their dissertations and theses, uh, that we can direct them in that. And currently we have 15 students, uh, both masters and PhD level students, uh, from primarily from North America and Europe, uh, but uh, we're really able to engage with them so that we can further expand the areas that our uh, the sport ecology research is, is touching on and really amplify what we're doing and further engage with the industry as we're kind of sprinkled all out throughout the world. And so, um, the next slide please. And so if you need to get in touch with us, uh, here's our contact information. Obviously, you'll have the slide deck, um, as uh, Kristen mentioned, uh, but uh, I appreciate uh, being able to be here in this webinar and the partnership that Green Sports Alliance 
has uh, struck up here uh, with the Sport Ecology Group to launch this webinar series. And I hope you all can um, tune in to the others uh, down the road. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. All right, thank you to everyone for the, those quick introductions. And now we're gonna jump into a bunch of questions that we're seeing come in. A quick reminder for those listening that if you do have any questions or comments to please put them in the chat box and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. So first question um, is over to Claire in terms of how you think sport organizations can connect to Earth Day's mission as their organizational entities and then how maybe individuals listening into this can also tap into Earth Day's mission and the Athletes for the Planet work? Um, thanks, Kristen. Good questions. <laughs> um, I guess as an organization, first, I would, I would encourage all organizations, um, you know, to help us fulfill our mission, I guess, continue to be part of something like Green, Green Sports Alliance. Uh, they're um, uniting diverse sports communities, and that aligns with our mission. Um, really, what you can, what I would like to do for for both the organizations and for people as individuals is uh, being coming from an athlete point of view is really challenge yourself um, and challenge your organization. Um, a lot of organizations, uh, you'll have to sort of self reflect on this. Would um, uh, are I are already in responsive compliance, I guess I would say, to uh, sustainable initiatives, but I would urge you to go from uh, not just a responsive compliance, but to move to a proactive leadership. Uh, try and identify within your own organization where you can make progress, uh, check best practices um, in your sector, and then uh, engage, inspire, and educate your fellow stakeholders in what you're doing. And uh, we truly believe that um, at Earth Day that the only way we're going to make uh, real change is, is to uh, all take these individual actions and uh, globally make something happen. It's, it's, uh, we need to do it as a global community, and we can see that in the current pandemic. Um, we can't work in isolation. So the more we can unite together and, and get best practices from each other and continue to inspire and educate, I think we're going to make some changes. Thanks. Yeah, and, and Chris, actually, on jumping off of that point, can you give a little bit more detail about what your role is like as an ambassador for Earth Day Network and for some of the other sports organizations you work with, giving a, a bit of insight into some of the initiatives you're focusing on, how you work with a range of organizations? We have a couple questions coming in about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I guess... I got started as being an IOC uh, athlete ambassador, sustainability ambassador. And the goal there is to educate athletes because I, I think the most important way to get this message across is to continuing to educate people, uh, especially athletes who are influential within their, um, within their worlds. So to, to work with organizations, um, it really comes down to a willingness of athletes, which is not always the easiest thing, I will say. Um, when you're working at the elite level, um, you know, athletes tend to be a little selfish in that, you know, their their strongest motivations are for themselves and for performance, and that's what gets them there. That's, you know, not true across the board, but I think you have to find with each athlete what is important to them and to help them realize, I mean, in the winter world, it's a lot easier because a lot of athletes see how uh, climate change is affecting their sport, their performance, their competitions. Um, but it's easy to engage athletes um, because I truly believe that a lot of athletes love to do the, the, the right thing. They just don't have the proper platform or way forward. So that's why it's great partnering with the IOC, um, partnering with uh, athletes for the earth program, just because it's, it helps the athletes not have to think about another complete, um, that's a complete thing on their plate. So uh, working with Claire has been fantastic just because she sets a platform for me that, that gives me the ability to educate people. So 
it's everything's still kind of in the works. We're just getting started, but it's it's more about offering athletes the ability to have a platform that that works really well. And I'm currently working with the IOC on educating athletes and just helping athletes understand that these platforms are available. Great. And for yourself and maybe some of the conversations you have with fellow athletes, are there certain channels or ways that you are communicating either with your fans or with sport fans generally that you find are the most effective when you're talking about your messages specifically on the environment? Yeah, so a couple of years ago, um, I, am, I am the chair of the Federation of International Luge Athlete Commission. And a couple of years ago at our world championships in Germany, I wanted to create an initiative that, you know, allowed athletes to communicate with their fans. So we did, uh, we brought in a gentleman who talked about sustainability. We created a video on the simple steps that athletes could take and fans could take. And we played this video at World Championships and we had um, Protect Our Winners Germany um, helping go around showing this video and generating some fan engagement. And what we found was that the fans really enjoyed the fact that athletes were taking a step forward um, and being leaders in this role. And so that kind of was the start of driving, you know, athletes to be stewards of, you know, and sustainability. So to come back, um, it's it's hard to know what to do, um, but it's always just so important to start. And we have found, at least in Luge and with the, the fans, especially in Germany, that there is, um, the fans love the fact that we are, we are taking this leadership role. And now the goal is just kind of expand that. Great. And on the fan engagement piece, I'm going to let – Brian McCullough chime in here as he does a, a lot of research in the, the fan engagement piece around campaigns. And so, Brian, what are you finding, to Chris's point, are some of the most interesting outcomes or some of the lessons learned in your work around impactful fan engagement campaigns? Yeah, I mean, tying in with what Chris and Claire have said, uh, you know, it, it's really important to be able to enter into a proactive approach. And so sometimes uh, the initial data that we were collecting uh, was campaigns that were kind of just thrown together and maybe not as invested um, throughout the entire organization. And so awareness levels were, were quite low. And again, things weren't being leveraged as best as possible. But with the campaigns that have been formed on and invested in, just like any other consumer behavior campaign, whether it's selling tickets, merchandise, uh, what have you, if you were to invest in the same steps, we really see positive behaviors uh, resulting, both in the context of sport, but then also in their everyday lives. And so there is this transfer that, that is occurring. Uh, but, you know, sport fans and spectators and participants, whether it be a, you know, marathon 5K, are making decisions about what they're going to do to get to a specific venue at event before they leave their you know, residence um, and travel, whether that be you know, air and, and car. And so if you were to able to engage those people uh, ahead of time and recognize where certain um, vulner climate vulnerabilities would be or contributing aspects to the impact of the event, you can really start to engage them in those types of things, whether it be educating them about uh, uh, public transportation options. And one of the examples that we have, uh, we were able to work with uh, Special Olympics USA Games that was hosted here in, in Seattle. And we're able to, they launched a campaign uh, focused on their theme of the walkable games. And so when we surveyed fan, uh, caretakers of the athletes, it was somewhere around, I think it was around 72% uh, said that they were going to rent a car. And then after the event and after the campaign had concluded, we surveyed them after the event and found out that it was about 14% uh, of uh, the caretakers actually rented cars. And so this walkable game campaign really was successful. But again, it was invested from the get-go to ensure that uh, they're engaging and educating uh, the different caretakers or participants in an event that they can make these steps to reduce their impact. So these campaigns are really, really effective. Uh, and it's kind of 
using that example, I mean, the things that Chris is saying, the social influence of athletes is great. So those touch points can be really be leveraged uh, to really influence fans and participants as well. And are you looking at how the, the, the interest of fans and is there any information that you can share with us on some of your research of how interested are fans really in environmental issues? Are there certain issues that are really hit home and, and pretty much uh, there's much more of a um, interest there or are there some issues that may be more divisive? Where could be a couple of examples of issues that either athletes and or organizations can start to communicate about that will resonate with maybe the most or the most um, popular issues at the moment? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, when fans specifically attend a, a sporting event, uh, their environmental part of their brain isn't necessarily activated. So that identity uh, isn't activated. It's not salient. Their fan identification is salient. So touch points or the connections that an individual has to a sport brand, whether that be an athlete, a coach, a team uh, in college sports, the institution, um, those aspects are really important to be able to leverage. And so whether you're in uh, spe specifically talking about um, in the United States in a more progress, politically progressive area or a more politically conservative area, you can leverage this fan identification in a lot of positive ways. However, you know, when the team is messaging or an individual athlete is messaging, there has to be good fit, just like any other marketing campaign. There has to be fit between the organization and the cause that they're taking up, right? So there's great fit across the board, obviously, with the uh, COVID-19 response uh, that the different teams are having. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't necessarily make too much sense in Seattle to talk about water conservation when people here might be thinking about, well, we've got tons of water. But Arizona, Southern California teams would be really, you know, benefit from talking about water conservation and engaging their fans in that way. So the fit has to be there. Uh, the team might have to, would have to walk the walk and be a legitimate and authentic messenger to it. So it's not like saying, well, we should compost and recycle in your everyday lives and not actually be able to provide those resources and those opportunities at our events. So we have to really make sure that we're um, authentic in that way too. Got it. Thank you. We're also getting a couple of questions about the current pandemic and how we are in almost a complete lockdown of sports. And so I'm curious, this may be over to, to Brian first and, and Chris and Claire can weigh in about how maybe you're seeing athletes and sports organizations addressing the pandemic at hand, how the, we're seeing the athlete voices being really effective on this, and maybe what we can learn from this void of sport and the, the power that we are all feeling in it, and how that can help with future climate conversations and awareness. I think the collective action is the most encouraging thing. Um, granted, a lot of this is government imposed, uh, but the compliance with it is is really encouraging to see. And I think a lot of that can be leveraged into climate action, um, you know, with making the appropriate narratives uh, to fans, to participants that, hey, this is something that's coming down the road. We've already experienced something that kind of caught us off guard, but we know that this is happening, this is coming down the road, and it's going to impact your your everyday life again based off of your consumption of sport as a spectator, but also as a uh, participant, whether that be in fishing, hunting, skiing, what have you, it's going to impact you. And so I think those can be leveraged. I think you see a lot of encouraging things of coming out and people connecting with sport just because we don't have it and mm -hmm. people are scratching, uh, trying to look for a niche or have a niche to scratch with watching sport. Um, but I think we're really starting to see people engage on social media in that way, and that's a great platform that athletes and teams are interacting uh, at this stage. Yeah, yeah and Chris, I, from your oh, go ahead, Claire. <laughs> Sorry, um, I I can uh, you know sort of piggyback to what Brian said there. Um, I I also find it very encouraging that we're we're acting as a global community in this crisis and uh, you know, doing the best we can to flatten the curve and all the current trending words we're using. But um, 
it gives me encouragement that if if people will will take the climate crisis seriously, uh, that we will be able to globally act um, and not just wait again, be proactive, not wait for what we see anecdotally happening, like snow melt and um, uh, ocean rises, um, but uh, also to act as a global community to reduce this and and stop this from becoming a, a climate pandemic. Um, so Chris, over to you, but um, I, I, I'd like to echo what Brian said. I, I think it's encouraging actually the way we're acting now. Yeah, thanks guys. I, I do want to stress that what I saw early in, in I would say even the middle of March was athletes using their voices and even simple hashtags like flatten the curve that athletes, despite being interrupted from their, um, from their careers, essentially from their competitions, still promoting the fact that we as humans need to flatten the curve. We need to do things. It's, it's bigger than sport. It's bigger than ourselves. Um, of course, some athletes are going to be upset. Um, look at the NCAA. A lot of those athletes, um, were really unhappy at first when their seasons were canceled. But what you're seeing now is an understanding in the athletes using their voice to, um, you know, stand up before the International Olympic Committee and saying, we need to push the Olympics. We can't go to Japan. Um, and athlete voices leading the way. So I, I do want to say that as athletes, in the sustainability, in the env environmental world, yes, we might have terrible carbon footprints, but our voice is very important. And when we use it, it does have power. So if we can educate people, then I really think that we can make a change here. And it's just getting all the athletes on board and understanding how important their unified voice is. Because, I, I mean, if you can have countries saying they're not going to go to the Olympic Games before the IOC says that, and it's driven from athletes, that is incredible. So I do have hope, um, but it's gonna require a lot of strength on the athletes. So education is really important here and coming together with a unified voice um, is an even bigger challenge. But I think after each year goes by, when the climate is warming up, when we're seeing our environment degrade, we'll have the power to unify people more and more I just hope that it's not too long into the future that this happens. Yeah, I think we're seeing a lot of the same with our work at the, the Green Sports Alliance. We've started tracking news stories in the sports space of who's stepping up and, and who's really using the power of sport to help in, in this specific crisis, knowing that the climate crisis is one that we all need to keep on our mind as well. And I think your comment of the sports organizations choosing to sit, the NBA coming out and saying, we are postponing our season and definitely we are going to take these major steps to not play to protect the health of our world was a, a huge eye opener, I think, for many people who, to, to the point earlier of maybe not as being so jarring if a politician said it or, or if a scientist said it, but once uh, the whole sports community came together and we're seeing it with the Olympics as well. I think there's a lot of lessons learned from this and the power of sport that, that can be applied to the climate crisis. And I think it will, will, it'll be interesting to see how that happens uh, once this current crisis hopefully comes to an end very soon. And a little bit on that point, we had a question come in about the communication aspect and, and how to implement communication efforts either at venues themselves in order to educate their fans or even campaigns that may happen on television when, when people are not in the venue. So if if maybe Brian is first to, to start with you about what kind of, what recommendations might you have for organizations to either start looking at or implementing at their venues to start educating fans, whether it be uh, about recycling, whether it be about energy use, um, to not necessarily issue specific, but general ways that um, venues and teams can do a better job of educating their own fans. 
Yeah, that's another great question. And, you know, when you focus specifically in venue, you're hitting a very small fragment uh, of your overall fan base because most of your fans are going to be watching um, uh, on on TV, uh, streaming, what have you. And so those are the types of fans they really want to reach, again, to leverage your your fan identification to educate and draw awareness to whatever issue it might be. And that can be engaging current partners that you do have, um, you know, even doing an assessment of what your environmental impact is uh, beyond just simply your venue in the event, uh, but looking at your overall organizational impact and really start to identify ways that you can uh, engage in new ways to address issues and bring in new corporate partners. And these corporate partners, I think, um, I remember when I was home watching the game, um, I'm a San Francisco Giants fan. Uh, they had a partnership with, uh, with PG&E, and there was an uh, ad from PG&E saying, you know, while you're watching the game tonight, turn off the lights, conserve some energy, and s- snuggle up with whomever you're watching the game with. And, you know, it had, a, in some ways, a cutesy message uh, associated with it, but also, you know, was doing something fun and light uh, about um, turning off the lights, I guess. I'm sorry, no pun intended there. But, uh, but those are types of things that can start to draw awareness to fans in their everyday lives on how they can translate things. And those types of campaigns are effective. Uh, but again, it would be really uh, assessing what's going to resonate with different segments of your fan base and through what mediums. So, you know, your social media crowd is going to react differently than those that listen on the radio or maybe are uh, you know watching on television. So those different mediums would have different campaign strategies, just like any other, again, consumer behavior campaign. And those aspects can really start to influence and move the needle in a positive way. And we've seen that uh, in the collegiate context um, with some of the more progressive uh, collegiate athletic departments in this space, uh, but also with professional teams as well uh, in North America and beyond in, in Europe and whatnot. Yep, definitely. The the audience is critical and you have to speak to them in, in whatever medium they are following along. So I think that's definitely a key takeaway. Another question for Chris that came through, you mentioned that you are you, your own carbon footprint and how that can be a challenge for a lot of athletes that you have personally chosen to purchase carbon offsets. Uh, The question is about how have you gone about financing these, whether it's something that you've chosen to do on your own, if you've looked into opportunities potentially from sponsors to do this for an option for athletes, and if you see organizations even offering support to be able to offset emissions for athletes more broadly. That is an awesome question and something that I am working on so up to this point uh 90 I've, I've i do have a sponsor now that will help me offset this um but a lot of times i'm just doing it on my own uh i started like i fly united airlines a lot they will offer um you know just a simple click of a button now working with like uh the united nations through the ioc they have a couple different programs but that was my big question to the ioc when i uh, came into this role was how do we deal with the carbon footprint that athletes are generating and if top sponsors um, of the IOC would be willing to help out. And at this point, um, there's it's still a work in progress. Um, so I'm still working on this, but it actually has been more difficult than I was expecting um, to try to find people to offset athletes' travel, um, their traveling carbon footprint. So currently, I just do this on my own. That's my own personal initiative. Um, And I'm very fortunate where I have the ability to do that because not everyone has the ability to do that. And I fully recognize that. And that's why it would be fantastic um, for athletes to be able to talk about sustainability and not feel hypocritical because I do feel hypocritical talking about sustainability because of that massive carbon footprint. Uh, two years ago, I flew 150,000 miles just on United. And that is a mass, massive amount of CO2 going into the air. So not everyone can offset that. Uh, but I think that is a great discussion. And that is a discussion point that I'm having is understanding how um, 
athletes can work with sponsors to reduce their own personal carbon footprint. But as of right now, I don't have a solution to that. And that's something I'm working on. But that is, that was my initial question going to um, the IOC. And we're still working on a feasible way to attempt to accomplish this. So fantastic question. And a question a bit I mean, related. The, oh, yeah, go ahead, Brian. Uh, just to build off of what Chris is saying, I mean, and and kind of also to make you not feel less guilty here. I mean, you're at least acknowledging that you do have the footprint, you're tracking it, and you're offsetting it. And I think that kind of goes into the, the background of saying, like, if someone were to criticize you, that you can say, here, here is my footprint. This is how I am offsetting it. And you're kind of going through that educational standpoint. And in some ways, your your impact is exacerbated because of climate change. And so, you know, you wouldn't have to be traveling as much to different sites to practice uh, by changing, you know, weather patterns and different things like that. So, I mean, that's where the educational component really comes in and kind of, uh, but again, you're more of on the proactive side of things and, and really engaging on that high level. So, you know, hats off to you for that. And, and a follow-up, a, a bit related question in terms of sponsors and how they obviously play a, a pretty large role in the uh, income of an athlete. If you have either personally, for Chris, had conversations or discussions with the brands that you partner with or, or that you endorse, and if you've talked with other athletes who are thinking about environmental issues or sustainability issues when they're choosing what companies to support and, and put on their their jersey or uniform uh yeah that's that's another great question um i i come from the sport of luge which is a, a relatively small sport um and to be honest it is difficult finding those sponsorship dollars i'll tell you what it is not a, a sport that you're going to retire from and, and live well you are you're you're fighting through your entire career and so so you really are trying to find any sort of dollar but at the same time you're absolutely right you do want to think sustainably um so one of one of the uh, companies that sponsors usa luge uh is dow chemical now dow dupont and it's been really fascinating working with them at such a high level because they do have a complete sustainability team and i can see firsthand that this giant company which i actually didn't believe had you know, such a great track record, but how hard they are working internally and to, to further their own mission. So even if you are working with companies like that, your teams are sponsored by, your international federations are sponsored by, you also can be influential um, even when you don't think they have the best footprint. Uh, so that's one way to, you know, be present um, within all these sponsorships. But yeah, when when you make a decision on who to go with for a clothing sponsor, I, I do think it it is um, on the athlete's mind where it's coming from, uh, at least on my mind and some of my teammates. So again, that's just educating athletes on how their daily decisions can affect you know the climate. Um, and so I think that's number one is we have to do that. We have to educate athletes, but also as athletes and you know being stewards of the environment. When we are working with these you know, massive Fortune 500 companies to also be pushing for this, be, to be pushing for sustainability. Um, so there's two ways we can go about that. And that's one of the unique roles that athletes have that most people don't get to see or have the ability to influence. And I think I can jump in a little bit and, and uh, thanks Brian and Chris, cause you've, you've got my brain working uh, and Kristen for the question, but um, I also wanted to say from an from a organ a, a sports organizing body uh, perspective, um, if you think back to the days when it was um, you know we used to take uh, cigarette companies or certain alcohol companies, and we just you know was were keeping our our uh, companies alive with whoever would sponsor them. Then we became a little bit more discretionary in who we were working with and actually said categories that we wouldn't work with, et cetera. And I think if we look at the uh, sustainability piece of everything, we can also pick and choose and put into the statutes of our organizations that we won't work with sponsors who at least don't have um, initiatives in their own companies for sustainability. So I think there's ways you can promote it 
um, not just from individual action, but also on the company level when you look at sponsors. Thank you, Claire. So shifting gears a bit, we have a couple of questions on a similar topic, which I'm gonna try to push together into one. It, it touches on the challenge that I think we all face in our own personal decisions and also corporate decisions about how some sustainability efforts have costs associated with them, whether uh, sometimes purchasing renewable energy, dealing with compostables, recyclables, really runs the gamut. And, and sometimes these options can be more expensive than their alternative. So how can we, as sustainability, sustainability leaders, persuade decision makers within organizations to adopt these type of initiatives? And so while the, my panelists think through that, I, I can quickly just say from the Green Sports Alliance perspective, this is something we hear all the time. We definitely view green sports as being uh, the same business issue as corporate sustainability, the, the more traditional sense of, of mainstream corporate sustainability. And sports teams, are, they are businesses and they need to find the ROI in whatever decision that they make. And so what we really work to do with our network is to bring together the leaders in a specific issue area or a specific action and highlight how they may be finding both financial success, whether it be direct financial success or kind of secondary with fan engagement components and reputational components and, and all of those harder to, to value pieces. So we, we really work with some of our sport members in addition to the companies that they're working with on composting, on adding renewable energy to highlight their case studies, to find the ways that they were able to either uniquely finance a project or have a partnership where there was more of a, a sponsorship element where branding played a role into it uh, as part of a sports renewable energy partner. Um, we're seeing a couple of even sustainability partners specific to sports teams, which I think just adds the company uh, a really interesting position and example where they can maybe even have reduced the cost for the sport entity itself. So there's obviously a lot of different issues that sports organizations are addressing, but really trying to find and encourage those partnerships that do make financial sense, that do make business sense, tell that story, have conversations about it, dive into the nitty gritty of how a certain team and company was able to do that and make sure that the our network and the global green sports network can, can learn from those and replicate some of those uh, success partnerships. So I'll see if any of our guests have anything to add on on that piece in terms of how to really persuade decision makers making sure that you have to make the business case first i i would just jump in Kristen, and say uh it, it, yeah i agree completely that it's very easy to tell people to do the right thing but if it's a financial reality that it's going to be a disadvantage it's very hard to push it through um again i, I think organizations like yours and uh, Brian with your sort of more data and science-based initiatives that you're you're able to to pull together for us um, if we can uh, share best practices uh, you know and at least if if organizations are saying look I can't afford to do this but I'm trying to find a way to do this uh, and they're reaching out uh, then I think the more information we can share the more um, problems we can put together and say we have to find a financially um, uh, viable solution um, then we'll be able to to move forward but I applaud any company that's at least trying to do that yeah I, I think the it's really important to stress the journey aspect right we're, we're never going to hit an, uh, a level where we have no environmental impact uh, that, I mean that's just not going to happen I mean it's it's we can offset things that we can't reduce uh, any further, but you know the the business case go the ease of kind of selling the business case really goes into the organizational values. And yes, obviously there is a financial component there, and sometimes uh, you can look at a budget as a reflection of your organizational values. So what are we paying for, and what are we willing to prioritize? And you know the expansive involvement of all departments within an organization if it's valued across the organization 
what you're going to start to see is this collaboration across departments where there aren't silos and that you can engage the corporate partner office to really you know educate them on ways that they can push or negotiate uh, into new partnerships whether that be offsets uh, with an air partner or a uh, an energy partner and looking at those aspects on how they kind of come into play I mean, the Seattle Mariners are uh, a great example of that and Scott Jenkins and what he what did when uh, he was there you know doing facility upgrades and energy savings from that but then bringing in other partners like Plan LED to upgrade this uh, stadium lighting and you see their energy consumption because of those LED lighting you know dropping by 70 75 percent so I mean those are some really really interesting stories on how you can involve the entirety of the uh, organization to really leverage those aspects and kind of make that business case but the values have to permeate throughout it can't just be siloed in you know facility operations event management yeah no that makes a lot of sense and so just in the interest of time I'm going to quick jump to our uh, final last question if everyone can give in the the light of Earth Day and Earth Month and as much as we all are dealing with very challenging period. There's always something that we can do for the planet and to feel good about what we're doing for other people. Um, so I'm just gonna go down the line and ask if you have one thing, action, that you would recommend someone listening to take part in and maybe as a distraction from the coronavirus pandemic, um, but also helping our planet at the same time. So Claire, I will go to you first for a quick action for our audience. Thanks. Um, I would urge you all uh, for this Earth Day, please um, log on to our site, earthday.org. Uh, uh, there's a massive amount of um, options you have. There's a map you can go to and see what events are happening nearby you. You can partake in. Um, all of those are, most of those are switching over to digital. Um, so certainly take a look. You can select whatever your interest is um, and go towards that. And there's lists of actions. They're so numerous, I couldn't pick one, but um, thank you. Uh, please take action. Thanks, Claire. Chris, over to you. Yeah, and I just kind of want to finish on what Brian was talking about in the last question is that just try to involve ask, athletes, ask for athlete involvement during these projects because it's, it's also really important for that feedback to, you know, come from the people wanting to you know, work on these projects to sponsor these projects. And yeah. if they can engage with athletes and athletes can engage with their fans, um, it's just going to make projects like projects like these just happens faster, smoother, get people excited. So I think my big takeaway is just, you know, ask your athletes if they want to become involved uh, and then just help give them a platform through all the projects that you're thinking about. And finally, just, uh, yeah, don't use your dryer. Let's try just hang drying clothes because that's a huge contributor to our carbon footprint. And it clothes last longer. I'll jump on that one too if you don't put them in the dryer. <laughs> so a good tip there. And Brian, we'll end with you. I would recommend everyone to check out the other webinars that we have throughout the month. If you can attend them, they will be posted on our Earth Day website. But you know. Granted, there are a lot of other new demands on our time, uh, given, given the circumstances that we're in, but we need to re realize that sustainability should be framed as a process and not necessarily a status. And so it's always evolving. And we can, as a sport ecology group, can connect you with students that are looking to do projects in this space or you know, looking for internships, um, which are now harder to come by. But uh, we can also connect you with our team of researchers uh, to be able to you know, review, enhance your organizational initiatives and do whatever we can, again, to uh, forward this global movement of ensuring that the sports sector is used as a piece in the puzzle to, uh, for ultimate climate action. Well, thank you to all of our speakers for joining us today, everyone who listened in and submitted questions. We really appreciate it. Here, as Brian mentioned, are the other webinars we are doing this month as part of our Earth Month webinar series with the Sport Ecology Group. Again, we'll send all this information in a follow-up email, but we hope you can join us for these webinars and um, more in the future following Earth Day. 
thank you all very much. We hope you can join us in the future and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, Kristen. Appreciate it. Thank you for having well, thank me. Thank you.